Thanks for sticking around. Um, this last uh, panel. Um, so my name is Jason Adolph. I'm a faculty member in biology here at Monmouth University and an affiliate faculty with uh, a UCI and the our, our uh, Marine and Environmental Biology and Policy Program. Um, I, I want to start off the panel by um, quoting a paper I read in uh, a class this semester, which kind of sets the stage for what we're going to be talking about. Uh, it's by a, a paper that was new to me, but it's a 2015 paper by Gattuso. Um, and it starts off, the oceans moderate anthropogenic climate change at the cost of profound changes to its physics, chemistry, ecology, and services. And I don't think this is news to many of us in the room, but I thought it was a very elegant and profound statement to, to start off with. Um, we know the example is the, the ocean absorbs carbon dioxide that's emitted by fossil fuel burning, but at the cost of acidification, and the consequences there, uh, the oceans absorb heat from the atmosphere, but at the cost of sea surface temperature changes that affect um, uh, fish distributions and impact sea level rise through thermal expansion. So um, that gets to the, the kinds of things we're going to be talking about on this panel. And I, I, in the title of this panel, I, I brought up the idea of anthropogenic eutrophication as well. And you can really think about that in the same sort of terms <coughs> as climate change. Um, there was a recent uh, discussion of ocean dumping in New Jersey in this room. And what we were doing then was asking the ocean to take care of our waste. And we still ask the ocean to take care of our waste, but at also um, profound cost to the ocean. Uh, things like uh, eutrophication, um, harmful algal blooms and deoxygenation, and just general degradation of water quality. So uh, today I'm excited to host a panel of experts um, who are going to dis discuss specific examples of um, how the coastal ocean is being impacted by anthropogenic climate change. This is the, this is the science portion of the symposium. Um, although I have to say, as a scientist, I've enjoyed listening to all the, the policy talks um, up until now and learned a lot. Um, so our speakers, you'll find extended bios of the speakers in the program. Our first speaker is going to be, I'm going to introduce briefly all the speakers now and then and call them up in this order. Our first speaker is Dr. Chris Gobler. He holds the Endowed Chair of Coastal Ecology and Conservation at Stony Brook University in the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. Um, then we'll hear from Dr. Vincent Saba, who is at the NOAA Northeast Fisheries Science Center, a geophysical fluid dynamics laboratory in Princeton, New Jersey. And then finally, Dr. Alistair Hobde, who is visiting from a uh, university of, uh, from Tasmania, Australia, where he's the research director at the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, CSIRO, and an adjunct professor at University of um, Tasmania. One of the things that struck, strikes me about the work of these three individuals is that beyond the science of, of, of climate change and the effects on marine ecosystems, all of them does very creative research and ties those that the scientific findings to impacts on communities, the people that live, work, and play in the oceans, and they make that extra step to, to relate uh, what they study to those, those populations of stakeholders. So with that, I'll ask Chris to come up and get us started. Jason for the invitation. Uh, thank you for all of you for attending and it's an honor to be here uh, at Monmouth University. And um, you can see the title of my talk, The Future Is Now, How Climate Change Has Altered Coastal Ecosystem Function and What Can Be Done to Make These Systems More Resilient. Um, so we all know what the projections are for temperature on this planet uh, and those are shown here and uh, you can see this uh, plot goes out to the year 2100. Uh, and there was, I think, sort of a consensus among scientists, uh, climate scientists, don't really talk beyond 2100, for, for the most part. Think, th try to present to the public in terms of what we expect 
this century. Um, but in my mind, even those sorts of projections, you know, 40 years out, 60 years out, 100 years out, are very difficult for the public to grasp. Uh, and I think, you know, possibly leads to complacency when it comes to the public wanting to make any changes. Uh, so this is temperature. Uh, Jason referred to ocean acidification. In the event anyone doesn't know what ocean acidification is, I, I just put this slide in just to show essentially the very simple chemistry and the idea that by adding CO2, you end up producing a uh, hydrogen ion there at the end, and that's the H and pH, which gives you your acidification. Uh, and that has negative ramifications for organisms that need to make a shell out of calcium carbonate, which would be like coral or bivalves. Uh, but continuing the theme of looking far into the future, um, here's one of the first papers to talk about ocean acidification. And here you can see they're projecting out to the year 3000, right? So if people had trouble with uh, the year 2100, now th this is really going to be an abstract concept. Uh, and and it, it has this very pessimistic view of humanity. It will combust all of our fossil fuels and our atmosphere will then reach a level of CO2 of over 2,000 uh, parts per million. Um, incidentally, is there a pointer? Um, if there's not, that's fine. Uh, I don't think so. Okay, not a problem. Uh, but anyway, uh, and continuing the theme that I think I've already heard uh, twice, and I've only been here for a short period of time, uh, these projections are now underestimates because we know CO2 levels are going to get higher than 2,000 parts uh, per million. But again, this is very far into the future, and with that, the acidification uh, of the ocean. Um, one aspect of climate change that refuse, receives a little bit less attention is changes in precipitation patterns. Uh, and this paper in particular highlighted how increased precipitation will change nutrient loads to coastal zones. It's something that, that um, Jason was interested in highlighting. And uh, it, this was a global study, but the study called out specifically uh, our neck of the woods. And I can say our, I'm from New York, so we're right here in New Jersey. Uh, that with nothing changing, increased precipitation will lead to a 33% increase in nitrogen loads this century. Uh, and just to show you one of the figures from that paper, um, anywhere on the right that you see a dot, that indicates that the model they put together had a very high statistical confidence. And you can see we've got dots all over Long Island and New Jersey. Uh, so this is definitely honing, this is a global study, but it had resolution down to uh, right here in New Jersey. Um, but again, this is, you can see the years here, this is far in the future. So what I want to give is a couple of examples of how we know that chain, climate change in the ocean has already affected marine life. And I'm going to start going back to the ocean acidification story. Uh, and here are the changes in CO2 uh, since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, this is known, the latter part is known as the Keeling Curve. A professor at Scripps Oceanographic started measuring CO2 every month uh, in Hawaii starting in 1958. We have a really good record. And humanity is setting a record right now. We're at levels that this planet's never seen. We're about to probably, probably this spring, uh, certainly go past 412. If you didn't see, this is the reading as of last week. So this is very up to date. And we'll probably in the next month or two come close to 415. And this is you know, very, very far beyond where we were not long ago. When I started doing ocean acidification research, my control condition was 375. Right? I'm not that old of a guy. <laughs> but it, you know, to keep up, you have to, things are changing very fast. And of course, this has consequences, as I mentioned, for calcifying organisms uh, that we care about in the ocean, bivalves, corals, uh, and other animals. Uh, and in New York, I just highlight here, here are the top 10 fisheries in New York. Five of the 10 are calcifiers, right? I'm sure New Jersey's not too far off there, which means that acidification puts our fisheries at risk. Of all these, and I should say, if you look at what these calcifying organisms are, they're all really calcifying bivalves, uh, which are known as ecosystem engineers. So beyond their economic value, they have important uh, ecological function within coastal zones, filtering the water, keeping that clear. Um, so with that knowledge, as I said, I've been doing ocean acidification research for about a dozen years now. This is one of the orders I started looking at. And when I did that, I started looking at the adults, the type you see here, and looking at acidification, found that you know, this doesn't really have a big effect. Uh, they don't seem to, to mind it too much using projections of past and future. Um, but 
that perception for me started changing when I looked at what are known as the early life stages of these organisms. For those of you who are, don't know, uh, invertebrates like bivalves are known as broadcast spawners. So uh, you're looking at actually in, in the upper right there, a clam spawning. And so for it to reproduce, it has to find that, that uh, adult clam has to find another one for successful fertilization. And below that are the larvae, uh, the result of that successful fertilization. And I'm pointing this out because what we discovered is the incredible sensitivity of these organisms to ocean acidification. So while the clams didn't, a big clam didn't mind too much if it was put in acidified water, these organisms were incredibly sensitive to acidification. As you'd expect, right? A baby is more sensitive to a pollutant than an adult. Um, but one of the big findings that we had is we, in this uh, paper here, we used a range of uh, CO2 levels that were present in the future, but we also had this first set here, 250 parts per million, which was sort of a pre-industrial level. And to our surprise, they, the, these larvae did much better at that pre-industrial level compared to what was the modern level not long ago, it was 4, 390. Uh, and of course, things look rather bleak going forward. And this is two different species of bivalves, scallops and clams, the same ones that are native to here in New Jersey. Uh, but this was kind of an astonishing finding, the fact that it's not the acidification in the future, but it's the acidification that's already happened is already leading to depressed rates of survival. And beyond survival, we also looked at the size of these organisms. I, these are microscopic. You saw the image before, it was a microscope. Uh, they get smaller and smaller and smaller under these high levels of CO2. And even the, the pre-industrial levels are bigger than those at modern day levels. And that has implications for survival as well. Bivalves have to achieve what is known as a predation refuge size in order to survive. So if they're starting out small, they will stay small, they'll be more vulnerable to predation, to predation and therefore more vulnerable, more likely to experience mortality um, beyond what I showed in that first experiment. That first experiment was only uh, the first few weeks. And so this finding actually was uh, incorporated into uh, a document put together by the Obama White House. You can see the figure up there. Uh, because they recognize that this is an important finding, the fact that it's not future climate change, but what's already happened. Um, and in New York, what's happened with these precise two species is that the landings are down between 90 and 99%. Um, and, and that's a huge change uh, in the way of life for New York, honestly. If you ever read the book, The Big Oyster, uh, it just shows how going back to actually the English settlers, shellfish have been at the heart of mariculture in New York and around Manhattan. Uh, and things are now quite different. Now we know there's many things contributing to these patterns. Uh, but we have a paper coming out soon that's going to show that, again, it's not, it, there are many factors, but acidification is part of the, uh, uh, one of the factors driving this trend. So, staying on this topic of current warming, uh, current climate change turning to warming, uh, this is just a screenshot from the Weather Channel website, uh, but just shows last summer, pretty warm, 11 <laughs> degrees above average. You can see there in the Gulf of Maine and Long Island Sound, New Jersey, also well above average. And I'm sure you know, but just to really emphasize, you know, water takes a lot of energy to warm up. Uh, you know, and, and we've heard about, oh, well, the ocean can warm and hold a lot of heat and the temperatures may, may not change. This kind of warming uh, is, is highly significant. Um, now, knowing this kind of warming was going on, one of my colleagues at Stony Brook performed a study uh, looking at temperature records going back to 1982. Uh, but these are temperature records for every, uh, every single degree of latitude and longitude on planet Earth for every single day. And that, is because, that can be achieved by using satellites, right? I shouldn't, say, I shouldn't say planet Earth, I'm sorry. Every degree of latitude and longitude in the ocean. But every single, uh, down to the square kilometer in some cases, ocean temperature every day since 1982. It's an unprecedented record. Um, it's really hard to explain all the data here, but what you're looking at are different coastlines across, planet, across the planet, uh, different latitudes, and then different days of the week. And you can see there are blue colors and then there are orange colors. Blue is cooling, orange is warming, all since 1982. Boiling this down for you, what this data shows is that ocean warming is not uniform. Right, so we like to say, oh, the ocean, the world's one degree warmer. Okay, true, 
But if you really boil down to what's actually happened in the ocean, you know, right now I can point to you and you can see for yourself, there are areas that have been cooling. And there are areas that have been warming. And some areas that have been warming much far beyond the global average. So it's very important when you think about climate change to think about the precise neck of the wood, so to speak, that you're dealing with. And so to give an example, here are the ocean temperatures around Long Island during the months of June, July, and August since 1982. What you're looking at is a warming trend that's three times the global average. And so that's, and I, I failed to mention, the non-uniform uh, extent of warming isn't just with regard to latitude and longitude, it's also with regard to time. So we're having three degrees above average warming in summer, but actually we're totally flat in winter. Winter temperatures haven't changed. So you need to be not only considering, and you, so you, we need to be thinking about that and the changes in temperature, not just at a location, but also at a time of year, particularly if you're interested in seasonal phenomenon like harmful algal blooms. Uh, and here's an example of some of the ones that we experience on Long Island. Uh, all of them, these are global issues and many of them are current New Jersey as well, but I have a little dashed line there to separate the three on the left that are make biotoxins and therefore are a human health hazard. And then the three on the right that are really just, you can call them a nuisance, they kill fish and they kill bivalves. Um, and so what we know is that these events have been expanding across the globe in recent decades. If you look at this map, on the top is the occurrence of something known as paralytic shellfish poisoning. Talk more about that in a moment. Uh, in 1970, and then below is the occurrence of it today, or 2015. Um, and so again, there's a consensus that these events are expanding. There's multiple hypotheses out there why this could be. We certainly are doing a better job of looking for these events. We know that there's a role for anthropogenic transport, for nutrients, and I'll come back to that. Uh, but what about climate change? Well, certainly that increase has occurred in a period of time where our oceans are warming. And so what I'm about to show you is a study that we performed that looked at that every single degree of latitude, longitude change in temperature since 1982, and then coupled that with the known temperature growth responses of two different harmful algae to essentially answer this question, based on the temperature change we're seeing in each location and each season, does that matter? So I'm gonna start with this species here, uh, Dinophysis. It makes this toxin, Ocadaic acid. It's a gastrointestinal toxin, uh, potentially carcinogenic. And this is the distribution of this organism, the known distribution as of 2010. And so what I'm showing you here is using that model changes in the duration of what we call the bloom season for this organism since 1982. It's a heat map, so it's very easy to understand. The warmer colors are area where the bloom season have, has expanded. Uh, the blue areas are where it's contracted. And the pattern you're looking at is one of the major predictions for climate change on planet Earth. And that is for organisms to stay within their temperature optimum, they're going to need to migrate towards the poles. And that's what we see here, blooms moving, out of the southern regions and towards the northern regions. We can also add in our model their growth rates. Uh, and so we see a really big increase in their growth rates uh, in the very high latitudes. I should mention the bloom season is only when the, their growth rates are optimal. Uh, and so you see an even bigger response in those high latitudes. Turns out in some of the regions that come up as big changes in bloom seasons and growth rates, are areas where suddenly we're seeing these events and we had never seen them before. So a few areas across the Northeast I'm highlighting here. Uh, again, you can see the years in which these bloom events showed up. That's within the time frame which, which we looked between, 2000, between 1982 and 2016. We also did this in the Pacific Ocean uh, and things look kind of boring there. You know, there's not a lot of change and that's consistent with some maps we saw in the last speaker in fact, that there's less warming in the North Pacific but if you hone in on this area uh, around British Columbia, uh, what you find is this is the region with the biggest expansion in bloom season. And again, I should have emphasized this is bloom season in years, uh, days per year. So since it's a 30 year study, that's saying that the bloom season is almost two months longer than it was at the start. Uh, and this happens to be the region where for the very first time, this organism has begun to form toxic algal blooms just as of 2011. 
And so when we look at this map, firstly, we can say that all of these events have occurred in, in Northern Europe since 1982, and that we have a whole slew of new events occurring uh, that hadn't before in these areas that are predicted to have occurred due to warming. Uh, the last part of my talk here is to focus on just one other harmful algal bloom, or the uh, almost second to last part. Uh, and this is probably the scariest of them all. Uh, you're looking at an organism that makes this compound saxitoxin. This is a neurotoxin that's 1,000 times more potent than cyanide. Gets into shellfish. Uh, and we, in New York, every year we have multiple regions that are closed to shellfishing because we get toxin levels that high. Uh, we ran the same models and saw very similar trends. Uh, we're in one of the hot spots, uh, as is Northern Europe, and it's uh, increasing both the bloom season and also the growth rate of the organism. And again, very similar trends. Uh, and again, we see this also in the Pacific. Uh, you can see specifically around the area of Alaska and again in the, uh, in the region of British Columbia. I should have pointed out, but I didn't, that all the stifling you see, those dots, that's not uh, an accident. That's where the models are statistically significant. Uh, and so just going back, the, um, that significance level is very high all across uh, the North Atlantic and also for these coastal regions in the Pacific. But again, when we look at that trend and we compare 1970 to today, many of these new regions where we've had PSP are these regions that have warmed into the optimal temperatures for this organism. Now the last thing I'm going to do is circle back to uh, the precipitation and nutrients. So this is what's, again, in the theme of climate change already happened. Here's the climate change that's happened. The change in heavy rainfall uh, across the United States, you can see a 71% increase in the Northeast. So actually our total precipitation isn't that different, but we're getting it in these very large slugs of one inch or more. And those are the events that don't just sort of make the lawn wet, but actually deliver a very strong pulse of nutrients from the land to the coastal zones. And again, I've already talked about that this is only going to intensify going forward. And another issue is that these harmful algae are promoted by nutrients. So beyond temperature, it's probably nutrient, or it is nutrient loading, specific, and in this case, as I'm discussing, driven by rainfall, that is probably another important factor. The nutrients also, can lead to acidification uh, by this very simple process where if you've ever heard of a dead zone in the ocean that has low oxygen, the same process that creates low oxygen creates high CO2. So we have acidification already happening and again, driven by nutrients. And just to put some uh, numbers out here, this is a little complex, this is a cruise to Long Island Sound. Uh, on the left part of each of the graphs is New York City. On the right part goes out to midway through Long Island Sound, and these are what are known as vertical section plots. So you're looking vertically down in the water. What it essentially shows is that area close to New York City, if you look at the top plot, it's dissolved oxygen that has low oxygen, is already acidified, already has high CO2, and the last one, undersaturated aragonite. But for a moment, I'd like you to look at those levels of CO2, over 2,000 parts per million. If you recall, that's what's projected for this planet in the year 22 or 2300. This is data from right now. So this acidification has already happened and is already happening, and it's not only being exacerbated by climate change, but also by nutrient loading. So my final point then is that this nutrient loading is exacerbating things that are driven by climate change. It's exacerbating acidification and harmful algal blooms, um, so I would argue that mitigating excessive nutrient loading will make coastal zones more resilient to future climate change. Um, so I don't want to go over time, so I think I made my points. I'll leave it there, and uh, we'll welcome well, the next speaker, or maybe Jason will. <laughs> Yeah, we are going to hold the questions to the end, so get your notebooks out or right on your hand um, so you can remember your questions. Um, next, we'll from uh, Vince Saba. Moving on to the coast and talking about uh, pinfish populations.
So my talk's going to move slightly off the coastlines onto U.S. Northeast shelf waters. Um, I'm a fishery scientist, but I sit at a NOAA climate lab. I'm kind of an, an anomaly where I work um, at Princeton. There's two federal labs on Princeton's campus. Uh, one is the place I work, the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab. So most mm -hmm. folks that work there are actually climate model developers. Um, my main task is to study climate impacts, and my main region is the U.S. Northeast Shelf. So that's what I'll be talking about. So just to give you some context um, for the research that we do in the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, um, which is part of the National Marine Fisheries Service under the Department of Commerce, a few years ago we published a uh, national climate strategy. Uh, this is not a um, policy document. It wasn't uh, approved by Congress or signed by the President. But it was an agreed upon document uh, among all the national science centers and regional offices throughout the country. And basically it gives all the different regions uh, throughout the U.S. Um, guidance on how we can conduct climate change research um, and possibly improve our management strategies going forward as the climate is changing. And so this, this particular strategy um, concluded with seven main objectives, starting from climate-informed reference points, robust management strategies, adaptive management processes, like for example, as fish are changing distribution, is our management keeping up with that change? Projecting future conditions, which I'll be talking about today. This is talking about long-term century-scale projections um, in living marine resources. Understanding the mechanisms of those changes. Uh, a lot of the work we do in our Sandy Hook, New Jersey lab uh, is geared toward understanding those process-based studies. Track change, provide early warnings with potential forecasts, near-term uh, forecasts. And then build and maintain an adequate science infrastructure. And this goes to our general observations. Putting our fisheries independent surveys out there, our boats, um, which are collecting data every single year to inform our uh, fishery stock assessments. And so from this national strategy, each of the regions uh, shown here were tasked with creating their uh, regional strategy. Uh, we know just based on the management infrastructure, the science infrastructure, the ecosystems, that every region can have its own specific needs in order uh, to study the impacts of climate change on protected species and fish stocks. And so here in the Northeast, we have what's called our Northeast Regional Action Plan. All these different action plans are available on the uh, NIMS Climate website under NOAA.gov. So in terms of commercial value, how does the U.S. Northeast compare to other U.S. regions? So in terms of the amount of catch by volume, uh, we're actually quite on the lower end. We account for about 13% of the landings by volume. This is as of uh, the NOAA 2016 report. Uh, however, by value, we're over a third of the U.S. value, and that's being driven primarily by American lobster and uh, Atlantic sea skull. Uh, there's a very valuable species. Uh, half a billion dollars a year uh, for both of those species. Fluctuates between five and 600 million, somewhere around there. But we're not nearly in terms of the um, uh, volume as we are in Alaska, which is mostly driven by walleye pollock. So they're catching more fish over there, which is less value, but it also increases their total value because they're catching more fish. So we really are concerned about some of the changes we're seeing in the Northeast because a lot of that U.S. value, over a third, is coming from this region alone. So the Northwest Atlantic is a, is a tricky place to model, um, both in terms of long-term projections and near-term forecasts. And the reason why that is is because we sit basically uh, at the interchange of two major current systems. So you have the Gulf Stream. Let me see if my cursor works here. It doesn't. So the white... Um, Arrow coming from the south is the north wall of the Gulf Stream. That's the tropical warm saltier water coming from the, the, the tropics. And then the black arrow is coming from the north. It, this, this is Arctic water from the Labrador Sea, known as the Labrador Current. That's the fresher, uh, colder water. And the northeast shelf sits at the interface of these two currents. And basically, two flavors of water circulate into the shelf. Um, and they can vary from year to year, whether we get more Gulf Stream water or more Labrador water coming from the north. However, our observations have shown, particularly in the Gulf of Maine, we've been getting more of that warmer Gulf Stream water coming into the U.S. Northeast Shelf. So we have this synergy of uh, global warming combined with regional circulation change that our observations are showing. But it's a pretty tricky place to model. So this animation will give you a sense of what ocean surface temperatures have done since about 1980. So the blue line are the global average uh, composites for the uh, global ocean. And the red line is just for the Gulf of Maine. And so as you can see, uh, there's natural variability fluctuations, decadal variability since 1981. But over the last 10 to 15 years or so, you can see that the Gulf of Maine has warmed 
uh, much faster than the global ocean. So, in the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, we have these surveys that go out every fall and spring. It's a bottom trawl survey, and they're what we call fisheries independent surveys. They go out there, uh, they're based on random strata, and they sample um, all the different marine taxa that they encounter. And so as the oceans have been warming, we're able to track changes in the distribution of the marine taxa that exist on the shelf. And so this is an example of our spring survey, which started in 1968. Again, this is a bottom trawl. And what this animation is gonna show is the catch per toe of Atlantic cod. Atlantic cod are cold water fish. Uh, the highest probability of catching cod is typically about eight degrees uh, centigrade bottom temperature in the ocean. And they're basically at the southern extent of their range in the Gulf of Maine and Georgia's Bank, and also in southern New England waters. So what this animation will show is as time progresses, the, the red, orange, yellow areas are where you're catching more cod, and then the uh, blue aqua areas are where you're catching uh, either none or very little cod. And so as time is progressing now, we're in the 90s, this again is their spring survey, not only do you see a northern shift in the distribution of these animals, but also a decrease in their abundance in terms of catch per toe. So this wasn't very surprising when we think about the enhanced warming that I showed you in that previous slide in the Gulf of Maine, but this is not just due to warming. We know this is also due to fishing. Uh, this species has been overfished over the past few centuries, um, in particular the last 50 years or so. So it's a combination of mismanagement, overfishing, and climate warming, and of course new species interactions as well, is what we're hypothesizing. So what does a warm water fish look like in terms of our fall survey? This is a black sea bass. This is another bottom dwelling fish. Um, but this is considered a warmer water fish. And so this survey data starts in 1968 as well. It's a bottom trawl, it's the same net, same boat. And what you'll see here is that as time progresses, you're gonna see a northern shift um, in the abundance of these critters. Um, and again, not surprising considering the warming temperatures we've seen, but there, there, there is a complex interaction between the warming temperatures, ecosystem change, and of course, top-down forcing from, from fishing. But in general, there's been a northern shift. So if we look across um, North America, this was a paper published in Science by Malin Pinsky et al. Uh, over at Rutgers. And, and what these group of authors found was that when they looked at all the different fisheries independent surveys that are run by the US and Canada, they found that the overall direction or movement of the marine taxa surveyed uh, varied. Uh, between regions. And if you look in the northeast, to the, the far right there, you can see this general northern shift. So again, you saw previously the temperatures have warmed faster than the global ocean, so it wasn't surprising to see this general northern movement in the marine taxa caught uh, in our survey. However, when you look to the north, off the coast and shelf of Canadian waters, there's this general southern movement. If you look to the Gulf of Mexico, you can see a western movement, and there, fish can't move to the north because they're uh, trapped by a landmass, but they did find that fish were moving into deeper, cooler water in places like the Gulf of Mexico. Off the coast of California, you see a general southern shift, and then you see variations in terms of direction in the Gulf of Alaska and the Bering Sea. And so ultimately what the authors concluded was that marine taxa were tracking the local climate velocities of the region. So where temperatures have warmed, they saw a general northern movement. Where temperatures have cooled, they saw a general southern movement. And then places like the Gulf of Mexico and Gulf of Maine, which is actually not shown here when we did a sub-regional analysis, uh, we also found, they also found critters also moved into deeper water as temperatures warmed as well. So it wasn't always just um, a universal northern shift. So in order to assess climate impacts over both um, near-term and also long-term, we have to look at global climate models. And whether we take these global models and couple them to regional models, uh, in terms of long-term climate change impacts, we do need to look at global climate Earth system models. So the lab that I work at, some of these models are actually developed there. Um, global models, basically, global climate models are fully coupled models. They have an atmospheric <laughs> model, a land model, an ocean model, an ice model, and they're fully interactive, so they can feed back on each other. You can then take this one step further with an Earth system model and add things like ocean pH, biogeochemistry, uh, primary production, secondary production. Look at things like changes in dissolved oxygen. And these are run on a global level, so they do have regional biases, uh, in particular things like ocean pH, uh, which is actually really difficult to model, very challenging, because we're finding that there's lots of variability in ocean pH uh, naturally, just within regions. So in terms of these models, as I mentioned previously, the Northwest Atlantic is a very complex area, the Northeast Shelf sitting between these two major current systems. So it's really important that when we take models to project climate change, 
that these models are resolving the regional circulation of our region. And so on the left here, this is an uh, example of a high resolution global climate model using a 10 kilometer horizontal ocean resolution uh, ocean component from GFDL. On the right, this is an example of a 100 kilometer horizontal resolution ocean model coupled to a global climate model. And when you run these simultaneously, this is sea surface temperature. You can see the model on the left is capturing the Gulf Stream fairly well. It comes off the US east coast of Cape Hatteras where it should. However, looking to the right with a, a typical climate model that's assessed by the IPCC, these models are very coarse and the Gulf Stream essentially overshoots uh, Cape Hatteras and runs into almost Long Island, uh, which of course we know is not the case. So when we're talking about climate change impacts, we really want to focus on models that are capturing regional dynamics. And so for the U.S. Northeast, over the past two, three years or so, we've been mostly focusing on this model to the left, this prototype high-res model that GFDL has produced in order to capture changes in the regional circulation, which we know are important, and we've seen correlations, significant correlations, to a lot of the important commercial and recreation fish stocks in the region. So what do projections look like when you use these high-res models and compare them to low-res models? The bottom right panel is an example of a doubling of atmospheric CO2 over 70 years, to 1% increase per year in the atmosphere in the model. The top two panels are uh, coarse resolution or low resolution climate models that have that same perturbation in atmospheric CO2. Um, so it's an apples to apples comparison. And what you can see is that in the high resolution model, and this is uh, ocean bottom temperature projected over an 80 year period where atmospheric CO2 doubles by year 70, um, which might not be too off base considering <laughs> the current trends in um, atmospheric CO2 that you saw in the previous slide. So doubling of CO2, what does it look like for high res versus low res? So the bottom right here shows that bottom temperature along the U.S. eastern seaboard, in particular in the Gulf of Maine, warms non-uniformly. Essentially, you get this enhanced warming in the Gulf of Maine in the high-res model, which you don't see in the coarser models. And the reason for that, what we found was that because the high-res model is capturing that regional circulation uh, better, it's resolving it much more realistically than the coarser models, it's able to show changes in those current systems as the climate is warming. And what we found was that as the climate warms in the model, the Gulf Stream essentially gets pushed to the north. And more and more of that warm tropical Gulf Stream water enters the Gulf of Maine and then circulates down south to our neck of the woods here in New Jersey and New York. Those coarser models couldn't capture that regional change in circulation. So it's really important that we focus on models that are getting those regional dynamics. Um, you can see the warming is very different. And if you look at our observations, the bottom right is actually what we're seeing today over the last 15 years. We're seeing this enhanced warming, which you saw in my previous slide, in the Gulf of Maine region, which we're attributing to changes in the Gulf Stream. So we can then take uh, projections from this high-res simulation and couple them to these very basic, simple thermal habitat models for things like Atlantic cod. Now these projections don't account for changes in fisheries mortality, uh, changes in bottom forcing, primate production, changes in ocean acidification. They're very simple thermal habitat models because we know that temperature change should be a first order response for ectotherms like fish. So for a cold water species like Atlantic cod, in the early parts of the run where there's not much warming, you can see lots of cod habitat. This is thermal habitat, this is not abundance. Throughout the entire northeast shelf, and as the model is warming, you can see less and less habitat, particularly in the south at first, and then shifting to the north, until there's virtually no uh, Atlantic cod habitat left in the Georges Bank and Gulf of Maine region. And this is actually what we're seeing today. And if you look at that graph to the right, you can see cod are number seven in terms of most valuable species in the US. They're in the top 10. That's mostly coming from Pacific cod these days because there's not much Atlantic cod left. What about a warm water fish? So here's summer flounder. These are a common species caught off in New Jersey. They're also called fluke. Um, summer flounder, if you take the projection from the high-res model coupled to a very simple model, thermal habitat model for, for, for fluke, you can see an ultimate northern shift in their habitat and also an increase in habitat volume for the species. So we're projecting simply based on temperature, no other factors, that there could very well be more habitat for a warm water fish like summer flounder as the waters continue to warm. But we do know we need to take other things into example like fisheries interactions, bottom up forcing, and of course multi-species interactions, and other variables well. Uh, in our Sandy Hook lab uh, here in New Jersey, we have some researchers looking at the effects of ocean pH on um, larval summer and winter flounder, and we're finding some substantial effects. So once we can couple all these things together, we can have a more um, holistic model that has multiple variables, not just ocean temperature. We've also looked at some of the more valuable species like lobster and scallop. 
This again is exclusively based on temperature. American lobster to the left, scallop, sea scallop, this is a sea scallop to the right. Red areas are where we're projecting increases in habitat, blue areas are where we're projecting decreases. And so for a species like American lobster, which are now thriving in the Gulf of Maine and have substantially declined in southern New England waters, especially in Long Island Sound, we're projecting continued increases in the Gulf of Maine, but we're also projecting this offshore movement from inshore fisheries to more offshore fisheries. Whether they can survive is unclear, but based on thermal habitat, that is what we're projecting. And we are seeing some of an offshore movement of American lobster in the Gulf of Maine today. With sea scalps, just looking at temperature, we're projecting more of a northern shift into the Gulf of Maine. And again, this is not accounting for changes in ocean pH, changes in predatory sea stars, which we also know are substantial on sea scalp habitat. This is just looking at temperature using the high-res model. So we can also put this in a context of impacts on um, society and fishing. So if we take these projections from three different species just based on temperature, uh, the purple or American lobster being the most valuable, um, somewhere in the middle, some are flounder and orange, and then in green, Atlantic croaker being the least valuable. The open circles are where these species are being caught today in terms of center of biomass. The closed circles are where they're projected to be caught seven to 80 years in the future. And what you can see is that some of these major ports along the U.S. northeastern seaboard will be closer or more farther away from these valuable species. So that could benefit some of these fishermen, but also can take a toll on fishermen who have to now increase their fuel costs to get to some of these valuable fish stocks, potentially change their gear to switch their target species. Um, and again, I need to emphasize over and over again, this is not considering other factors like changes in fishing mortality changes the way we manage these stocks, or even new species interaction, or even other variables like changes in ocean pH, production, so on and so forth. This is my second to last slide, I'm almost finished here. And um, we are now trying to confirm some of these thermal habitat changes that we're projecting with laboratory studies. I keep mentioning the Sandy Hook Lab, because that's where we do all of our finfish laboratory studies for the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, not too far from here. We're now taking critters like black sea bass, putting them in metabolic chambers, and we're measuring their respiration um, at different water temperatures so we can get a sense of where their optimum um, water temperature is for metabolism. And we're finding that this particular fish, black sea bass, seems to do best at about 24 degrees centigrade and starts to get stressed as the water increases up to about 30 degrees centigrade and becomes lethal, um, anything warmer than about 32 degrees centigrade uh, water temperature. So to summarize, the U.S. Northeast Shelf accounts for over, just over a third of the annual value of commercial fish throughout the country. Um, it's also one of the fastest warming regions globally in terms of um, uh, ocean surface temperature. So it's valuable, and yet warm temperatures here have warmed faster than most other places in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. The NOAA Northeast Fisheries Science is now almost exclusively using this new high-res model developed by GFDL to try to project changes, long-term changes, not forecasts, in ocean conditions and also uh, fisheries resources. And we expect continued distribution shifts of valuable commercial species um, under continued ocean warming and continued climate change. However, we do need to move beyond exclusive temperature impacts. And as these process studies that you heard in the last talk and some of the stuff that I mentioned today uh, come to the surface and are published, we can then use these studies to inform new models that, are multi uh, that use multiple variables to inform both forecasts and projections. So we need these, these laboratory studies are, are, are really critical. Um, and ultimately, the goal is to inform management. Right now, our management in the Northeast and throughout the U.S. is not really climate ready, in a sense that the management is not keep keeping up with the pace that we're seeing some of these commercial stocks and rec stocks moving. And so we're trying to uh, fix that. However, it's a very, very difficult process. Um, management councils here are still not considering environmental information when they make their uh, quotas for the year. Um, and so we need the more science and services to show the, the managers that uh, it's beneficial to their either their uh, next year's quota or quotas five years from now, um, the better success we might have. However, I do want to mention that near-term forecasts are needed, which I didn't discuss today. Fisheries managers are operating in the now, the year to two years seasonal. What I showed you today is all talking about 50 to 60 to 100 year uh, projections with, when I've presented this stuff to fisheries management councils in the U.S., they say, well, that's great, but what can you tell us about next year's conditions? And unfortunately, the forecasting skill in this neck of the woods, uh, in our neck of the woods, is not very good. Thank you very much.
update from Australia's CSIRO, who is speaking in his words about uh, climate adaptation strategies for large animals that people care about. to um, Randy and Jason and Tony for the invitation to join you for the week here in New Jersey. Um, I'm going to take it a little bit um, further along to what do you do after you hear all these terrible things that are going to happen in the, in the ocean. In particular, where I work in Hobart, which is in the southern part of Australia here, we have polewood currents that are flowing down from the north, bringing warm water into southern Australia. And that means that we're seeing these effects of climate change, not only due to the temperatures warming and putting heat into the ocean, but because the currents are moving and bringing warm water to the south with them. Um, how, how bad has this change been? If you're an Antarctic scientist, you might go out and take an ice core. And you know that people can drill in the ice and take a record from the bubbles that are in those ice cores of what previous conditions have been. And the typical way that those scientists do that is that they show you that from the basis of those ice cores, they can reconstruct on the top axis there the carbon dioxide concentration over the last four or eight hundred thousand years, and on the bottom graph there, the temperature record. And we can see that things have oscillated along in the past quite nicely with that kind of approach. But if you plot that data differently, and you do temperature against carbon dioxide, the climate system on the planet has oscillated between temperature and carbon dioxide conditions in those blue and red periods there. Ice ages are in blue, non-ice non -ice, non -ice ages are in red. And that's where our climate system's been oscillating for more than 800,000 years. And we, we, where we sit today, up in the year 2019, we're well outside that operating space. And so the conditions that we're seeing now, we're not likely to go back to any time soon. So this idea that in dealing with climate change, we're going to restore things to how they used to be, I think is a pipe dream. And so that's my push for why we need to do a lot more adaptation at the same time as we're doing, doing the mitigation efforts. This is an analysis that shows the rates of ocean warming over the past 50 years. And all of the spots that are coloured red and orange are places where the warming is extremely rapid. If it's in red, it's inside a country's economic exclusive economic zone. If it's in orange, it's on the high seas. And again, where we're working in Australia, on both coasts there, we've got these areas of really rapid warming. And that means that we have to be understanding those changes and adapting to them more quickly. And we can't look to other regions that are not red or orange to learn our lessons. If you're living in an area that's not red at the moment, you may be able to get those lessons from countries that are experiencing that change most rapidly now. <coughs> and in particular in southeast Australia, we've seen a massive amount of biological change. And I could tell you a hundred stories just the same way that Vince has done then about different species moving south. We've seen more than a hundred fish species moving south. 85% of the seaweeds on the east coast are now fast found further south than they were before. Harmful algal blooms are the kind of things that Chris talked about we're getting that um, harmful algal bloom outbreak, shellfish poisoning, closing of fisheries as a result of these changes. 50% of intertidal species that you can collect on the shore have moved further south in a 50 year period. And so that leads you to what would you do when you're confronted with this change? Half of the effort probably is going into people saying we need to reduce greenhouse gas emission. Surely if we get that under control, things will return to normal. That seems like that's been a bit of wishful thinking over the past 20 or 30 years. And while we're hopeful, I think we don't want to put all, all our eggs in the mitigation basket. So at the same time as people are continuing to argue that's got to be the main game, I think we need to start to be preparing with a risk management approach around adaptation. And adaptation is usually particularly local, and so that can be very empowering to communities of people. And I'll go on to show you just how working with local people and local managers with, to help them with adaptation efforts, I think can give the world a bit more hope than that story about how rapidly the climate is changing. And if you do adaptation strategies well, it should give you even more flexibility for the future. So think of it as untying someone who's tied down on the, rain tra on the train tracks. If the train's coming from a long way away and you untie them early, that person can go on to have a great career, do whatever they like. If you, do, if you leave it to untie them until the very last moment when the train's there, they might lose an arm or a, or a leg as the train gets close. So my focus is, got, is on adaptation at the moment. And the reason adaptation matters particularly for coastal systems and, and biodiversity is that depending on the amount of climate change that we're seeing, and this is the same um, slide that Chris showed, in this case going to the year 2300, how much warming we might expect to see. 
that amount of warming impacts different aspects of the climate system differently. And in this plot here, which is called the burning embers plot, it shows sectors of society and how they might be impacted by different amounts of warming. And so we've got things like our water security and our coastal, coastal communities, um, our energy security. And you can see where the bars turn red differs depending on where you are in the, each of those sectors. And so for energy security, for example, we'll probably be okay with four more degrees of temperature rise. But the one and a half degree line that we're aiming for with Paris is the horizontal black line. And natural ecosystems are going to be stressed you know, even if we meet that target. And that's why we're seeing the stuff that we've all reported to you. Species are moving into different places, shellfish poisoning outbreaks, disease movement and so on. So if you're prepared to accept one and a half degrees of warming, we're still going to have dramatic impacts on the natural environment. So what do we do about it? If climate change effort, um, mitigation efforts are very successful, mitigation will be very big and we will only need a little bit of adaptation to meet that. If mitigation efforts are less successful and we only have one of those three or four degree amounts of warming, adaptation has to do a lot of work. It has to catch up that three or three and a half degrees of warming. And if mitigation is really lousy and adaptation's done all, it's, all it can, you'll end up with this adaptation mitigation gap. And that'll be really problematic because we'll lose systems that can't close that gap. So what does that mean for natural system managers? At the moment, people who manage fisheries or biodiversity or um, iconic species operate more or less as curators. If we keep things safe and put our arms around them, hopefully those animals will be there for the future. We don't have very many people operating as engineers. But increasingly, as we get into the future, into the long term, we're going to need people who are willing to act as ecosystem engineers. We're going to decide what species we want in which locations, what disease modification we do, which species we reintroduce to new places. And so I think we're going to need to have more managers who are willing to act as engineers of a system if we're to have some of the things that we enjoy about our natural environment just even available. I'll give you the analogy of which one of these is going to be a useful manager. I use the plumber analogy. If you've got a water leak, who do you want to invite to your house to fix that? Do you invite a plumber who comes with no tools? Do you invite a plumber who says, oh, I've got a list of tools, I can come along and see how they go? Do you invite the plumber who's got a list and a set of tools, but he's never used them before? Come and help me fix the water leak, please. Or, uh, hopefully, you're picking out of this short multiple choice, option D. I want a plumber who's come into the house with the tools, a list, and experience in using them. So the challenge is, how do we equip managers today with the experience so that they can begin to respond to challenges now and be prepared? And my message is we've got to be prepared and practice with, with adaptation. One of the things that I'll conclude with is about then how do you develop an adaptation pathway with a community or a manager or a policy maker? And the first thing is actually develop adaptation options. And that's a real community experience. We're getting people together who understand and have deep knowledge about their system to think about all the things that you could do. And that can be kind of a, um, a controversial thing to do and it has to happen in a trusted space because some of the things that you might propose are going to be quite outlandish. They're only outlandish because we've never seen that happen before in a system. So I think in a trusted space we can have quite mature conversations about what range of options might need to go on the table. And then there are a bunch of different steps that you can do, and a scientist can help you with the rating, the options. We can do some testing either in models or in the field. Um, we can compare outcomes. We can develop this thing called an adaptation pathway that I'll show you at the end. And then hopefully that informs management and research and you continue to do this adaptive learning. But we're not going to wait until things are in crisis. So the example I'll tell you about is with a, um, a manager in Tasmania called Rachel Alderman, who's responsible for managing a seabird colony. She's had a 20 year or more investment in, of time in going out there and monitoring how many of these albatross species there is. And this albatross only breeds around Tasmania in three locations. Um, it's a pretty iconic animal and is well recognised by conservation and management around Australia as being something important to look after. But recently, and this plot here shows years on the x-axis and number of birds on the y-axis, there's been a dip in the number of birds. So we could spend the next 20 years studying why is that thing dipping down, is it climate change, or we could use it as a, as a chance to experiment and play with the system and see can we actually do anything about a species in decline. To support that we ran some population models and showed that no matter what you did in the future, if you're just going to put your arms around albatross and hope that everything was okay, you're going to continue to see declines in future. So those plots just show that we'll have less albatross than the horizontal line you would like to have. 
So there are these projections of poor performance into the future. And so business as usual won't offset the losses of Albatross. So we can go through a technical process, and this is a um, peer-reviewed set of approaches that let us generate options, and scientists and managers are responsible for that step, as they are in rating the technical appropriateness of different things. But then we need members of the um, legal and policy profession to help us with what are the rules that actually permit us to do these activities. What's institutionally possible? And finally, if it's technically possible and you're legally allowed to do it, will the general public accept it? And so that's got to be the last option. Is it socially acceptable in order to do the kind of interventions that I'm going to talk about? So let's think about some examples. We've got a group of albatross managers together. And what some albatross do, unfortunately, is boot the egg out of the nest every now and again. And if the egg falls out of the nest, you're not going to make an albatross chick. So should one of our interventions be putting the eggs back in the nest? We could sit somebody on the island who can walk around and put eggs back in nests. What about drainage? After heavy rainfall events, sometimes the albatross nests get flooded. Should we put agricultural pipe and do drainage through this colony so that we don't get flooding so much that kills albatross nests? Seems a fairly reasonable thing to do. Um, some albatross just make lousy nests. Can we get in there and provide them with better nests so that they don't end up in the mud like the individual on the right? And instead on the left you've got somebody sitting on a nice high nest. What about bird rescue? Here's an area of the island where the thermal currents seem to change and birds flying over that spot with a red arrow lose lift and drop down into this hole. When they're down there, they can't use that ladder that I use for getting out. They're, they're stuck in there. And so the chicks up on top are going to die. So should we rescue those birds? Now the traditional conservation will say no. All of those processes I've told you about are nest just natural. Don't get in there and mess with it. But I think we've got an obligation now to try doing that. And you probably didn't disagree with any of those things as being reasonable interventions. But what about the case where the remaining albatross in this part of the colony are being squeezed out by gannets? Are you comfortable if we're going to shoot all the gannets? What, is, what are we going to do in order to preserve the albatross? Are you willing to get in there and, and um, interfere with another species? Albatross are also getting disease and they get a pox. So should we treat the disease and help the birds recover in that particular way? So all of these options that we brainstorm with managers can be classified into an adaptation and vulnerability model. And that says that I'm vulnerable to climate change because I'm exposed to warming conditions or increased rainfall events. I'm sensitive to those conditions and I have weak adaptive capacity and that makes me vulnerable. So all of those options that I talked about can be plugged into reducing the exposure, reducing the sensitivity or increasing the adaptive capacity. So you can go through a long list of that with a, with a group of stakeholders. And then we can rate these things in a technical way. And on the bottom axis is the cost, with low cost being on the right. On the benefit axis, which is the y-axis, is high benefit on the top of the y-axis. And so what you're looking for, each one of those dots is one of those options that I showed you before. And they're just coloured by whether they are reducing exposure, reducing sensitivity or increasing adaptive capacity. And we're looking for things that are in the top right. They're low cost with a lot of benefit. And unfortunately for albatross, there aren't very many of those. Most of them are going to cost you a lot and don't provide much benefit. So by that filtering process, though, we selected a couple of options for an early experiment. And those are the circled options. The first one is disease treatment in the middle of the plot, and the other one is nest replacement on the upper right. So we set up an experiment where we sprayed one group of birds with a disease treatment and left another set of birds as a control. And after only six weeks, here are the results from that experiment on the right-hand side. Survival of birds is on the y-axis. The birds that were treated are in blue, and the birds that are not are in the other colour, if it's orange from where you're sitting. And in this case, the chick survival was 10% higher for spending two hours going around and spraying them with a disease treatment. So we can help offset these climate, climate changes just by getting in there and spraying some birds with a disease treatment. The second option was, that we've just been completing is making better nests. And on the left-hand side is long-term data that shows that breeding success of birds is higher on good quality nests and low on poor quality nests. And there are illustrations of a bird with a lovely high nest, like a volcano, and a bird which a nest is going to end up with an egg in the mud. So we engineered a whole bunch of artificial nests out of an air-blown concrete, manufactured them in the workshop at CSRO, helicoptered them out to the island, used child labour to get them all nice and smooth. <laughs> <laughs> um, helicoptered them out to the island and distributed them in, into the colony. And within two minutes of putting these nests out in the colony, the birds were sitting up on top of them. They're very side attached and there weren't any negative outcomes there. 
And so on that shot there, you might be able to see different uh, coloured nests being distributed through the colony. So we did a good experiment um, to be able to tell what the results were. And fortunately, the adults used the nests. They laid eggs and the chicks hatched sitting on top of these nests and they even fledged the chicks. And the breeding success in this one year of the experiment went from 17% chick survival through to 42%. Almost a threefold increase just by doing a simple intervention. So we in effect made extra albatross by going through this experiment. And that's going to help the population cope with the other pressures. With all of those things, you can now make an adaptation pathway. And this is a decision support tool to help managers think about how they're going to negotiate this space. And on the x-axis we have time, and on the y-axis we have interventions that help with the adaptive capacity of the birds, reducing their sensitivity or decreasing their exposure. And adaptive capacity is traditional conservation. Let's stop bycatch, let's keep out marine pred uh, pests and let's do the um, get rid of predators. We're already pretty much doing that set of activities. Um, the disease treatment is a way of decreasing their sensitivity to climate. They're actually a healthier bird and that's why they, they do better under climate change. The nest enhancement is under testing right now. But some of these other options, the world's just not ready for. So chick rescue. If we're going to get a really intense rainfall event, should we gather up all the albatross tent, uh, all the albatross chicks and move them into a tent? Might only have to do that for a couple of days. And then you put them back out. Maybe you'll save a bunch of albatross. Um, Translocation is the ultimate one. Once it becomes too hot on that island, eventually we're going to have to move those birds somewhere else or genetically modify them. Is the world ready for that? I suspect we're not ready for that, but by this kind of pathway, we don't need to do that for another 30 or 40 years. So you can do a bunch of engagement work and discuss with people all kinds of options, and managers can now choose what kind of pathway they, they would follow with helping the birds get through this um, climate-related challenge. And you're really just trying to buy time, because evolution should kick in if only we can give species like albatross more time. I gave you an albatross example, but we've been training managers, giving them tools, lists and experience in <coughs> marine mammals, in deep reefs, in Great Barrier Reef fish, the albatross example I talked about. Um, but the only one we've found a manager who's willing to test yet is in the albatross case there. Um, others are just still saying, we'd just like a list of this time, thanks. Um, I'll just end by saying, so I'm arguing we need a lot more intervention, a lot more adaptation. We need to train engineers. Typically the science career progression is that when you're a junior scientist, you focus a lot on impacts. You try and understand what's going on in the system. Then you, go, you, then you work out what's going on, and then you move to the <coughs> stage of attribution. Was it caused by climate change? Was it caused by nutrient enrichment? And then finally, you get to the adaptation. Well, what am I going to do about it at kind of the senior stage of your career? Um, you've only got a few years left though. So how do we accelerate that and get people who are ready to do the adaptation much earlier? and not to go through these phases. So our real challenge is how to speed it up. And the problem is that at the moment, we typically, when you arrive at a new system as a scientist, you typically begin first by studying the impacts. Then you go to the attribution, then you go to the adaptation. If I'm going to do that for the next 30 years, by the time I've given you the answer, the system will have changed. I'll have to go back to the beginning and describe the system again. So you'll never win if you follow this model. Instead, we need to encourage scientists who are willing to work in this way. As soon as they begin thinking about the impact of something, they've got to be thinking about the attribution and the adaptation. And if you're willing to do these things at once, I think we can run fast enough to keep up with how quickly the world is changing. And scientists are critical of each other. We got criticism for doing those adaptation experiments in Albatross because people said, well, what causes a disease? How do you know you're going to fix it? In fact, we said, we don't care. I don't care what caused that disease. All I know is I can fix it and provide a solution. And if it hadn't, if it hadn't worked, fine, we give up on disease. Now it's worked, we could go back and look at it if we wanted to, if it was worth the money. But if all you want to do is make more albatross, why do you care what caused the disease? Why do you, why do you bother what, investing your time in that bit of the answer, given how quickly the world's changing? I'll conclude then by saying we're in a time of really unprecedented change. Natural systems are going to be impacted first and they're going to be impacted at the coasts. We can come up with solutions that help this by looking at what causes the exposure, the sensitivity and the adaptive capacity adjustment that can help these systems cope. If we continue to do that by spending enough time on, on adaptation early enough, we'll end up with the things that people care about at the coasts, like iconic species or fisheries or clean water, all of the values that we hold will continue to have a chance at that, but only if we pay a lot of attention to adaptation now. Thank you. Thank you. So 
we have uh, we have time for questions. Anybody else? Them? We've heard about the, the ongoing issues in coastal environments. We've heard about projected issues in thermal habitat and fisheries. Uh, fish population movements and the importance of thinking about um, adaptation strategies um, earlier on in the process of understanding what's going on and what's causing it. <coughs> yeah? Uh, I, I've got a question that's sort of for the whole of the panel, I guess, and it's the question of um, this, this issue of mismatch, temporal and spatial mismatch of um, problems and solutions or problems and responses. And I suppose it's partly, you know, the, the problem of um, if, if we can reduce uh, land-based sources of marine pollution, it might help um, improve resilience to acidification, but the people who would benefit from reduced acidification or the organisms that would benefit are not necessarily regulated or the subjects of or the beneficiaries of that uh, regulated activity on land. How do you deal with that from a management perspective? And then similarly, when you start talking about um, industries that, or, or ports that might be winners and losers, how do you start thinking about the temporal dimensions and building up new port facilities in places that are likely to be winners and facilitating industry redirection in areas that are not going to be such successful fishing ports in the future. How are you engaging with um, those uh, disconnects and the constituencies that are responsible for overcoming those disconnects in spatial terms or industry terms or temporal terms? Well, I'll just mention on the nutrient loading front. Yeah. Um, you know, that's something that's being addressed not necessarily for climate change purposes, right? Because it's, it's also, for example, uh, preventing low oxygen zones or preventing these harmful algal blooms in the first place. Uh, but it's sort of a net now in coming to light that it's an add-on that it's going to be um, making these you know, certain components of the coastal marine ecosystems less vulnerable to future climate change. So, um, you know, in some ways, it's just in dealing with some regulatory agencies in the region, you know, sort of, it, it's almost extra, it's extra motivation, you know, to double down on controlling the things that you can in a local, in a local setting. You know, I mean, climate change is a very daunting issue, and, uh, you know, I think we, we heard um, that, you know, what's the likelihood that it's going to, you know, we're going to stop at 1.5, maybe, maybe not, and we, so, uh, whereas this new, mitigating nutrient loads is something that can be done on a local level that is, you know, will provide some resilience against climate change. One of the challenges in Australia is the Great Barrier Reef is um, being subject to nutrient loading, but the people who are throwing the nutrients on are sugarcane farmers who are 80 kilometres away. And we're going to now ask the sugarcane farmers, can you stop making easy money so that the Great Barrier Reef down here can survive. And there's no benefit to them in stopping what they're doing to benefit someone over here. And I don't think we've been able to work out what the value proposition is to, will you please make less money so the people over here can have a tourism industry or whatever it is. I don't know if that we know how to transfer those benefits. To answer the second part of your question, um, you know, in, in the US we, we face some serious challenges because Every region in the U.S. Um, is very different in terms of the history of fishing, the culture of fishing, and also the management of that fishing. And so, for example, here in the Northeast U.S., the oldest fisheries um, have existed since um, the colonists came here. And, for example, cod fishermen can have generations, we're talking like 300 years of family members who have been fishing for cod. And now all of a sudden we're saying, you can no longer fish for cod, which is what we have said from the, what the Fisheries Management Councils have suggested we do. And we, at the government, has enforced that. Um, and say, now you have to go fish for something else, sell your cod boat, um, and apply for a permit, which you may not get, uh, for a new particular stock that may not be as valuable as what you've been catching for hundreds of years. So um, it's kind of like steering an aircraft carrier. It just takes a lot of time. And unfortunately, the changes that we're seeing are happening so fast that our management is just not 
keeping up, and it's, it's, it's very, very difficult for us to do. We've had more success in the um, Alaska region. The fisheries there aren't as old. Um, there seems to be more flexibility, and we're using some of the lessons that we've learned from what they've done in the Bering Sea, and we're trying to apply that to the Northeast, um, but it's been, it's been very difficult. Keith, you had a question. Yeah, really more an observation. Uh, climate change is turning all of us into interdisciplinary professionals. And I really appreciated the, the caliber of your science efforts. And, and as I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, I want some economics now so that I can use your science in the policy arena and convince some people on the cost-benefit analysis. So uh, Chris and Vincent, I'd love it if you would not only take into account the commercial fisheries, but also go beyond into the recreational fisheries, which then would magnify the values, you know, the Long Island boating community and what happens to them. And, and, and Alistair, what happens to the tourist industry? I mean, where's the dollars backing up the, the birding industry and, and, and the benefits of the, the birds? Uh, and, and I know, you know, you guys can only do so much. So do you ever think about passing your papers on to your economist friends and getting them to write the next paper so that then they can get in the hands of the lawyers so they could do some advocacy work with it? Yeah, I could take a first. So in the Northeast, we actually have a social sciences branch. We're among one of the few science centers in the country that has um, economists, anthropologists, social scientists working as federal scientists um, addressing these issues that you just talked about. And we have done vulnerability, uh, I didn't have time in my talk to show it, but we've actually done port-specific vulnerability analyses, and one of my colleagues, Lisa Colburn, has done that and, and just published it. And we found that ports that are currently, for example, catching a higher um, uh, diversity of fish were suggesting that they may be less vulnerable to climate change as opposed to ports that are catching less diversity. More focused, for example, ports because they're catching, for example, primary scallops, which may have trouble 25, 30, 40 years out, but ports that are more diverse. But We've also just started to scratch the surface in terms of looking at these larger, more complex biological eco uh, economical models to look at things like fluctuation in price. Like, for example, what happened in 2012 when lobster went through the roof in the Gulf of Maine, actually drove the price of lobster down that in one season. It was extraordinary. It was the highest yield of lobster on record, and the price dropped. There were lobsters rotting outside of Canadian canneries. There was just too many animals to process. And that paper, there's a few papers, one was published by Kathy Mills, was an example of how a change in one season can trickle up through up to the market um, in a single season. So we're having case by case studies, but I think you're right. We do need to have more of that human and, and social and economic factor in our models. I agree. I, I hope that economics are not going to be the total argument. And we do have, you know, we all put together multidisciplinary teams and transdisciplinary with stakeholders. But some of the things we care about actually can't be rigid, can't be measured in value. And if you, even if you could do that, it would only be for the current generation. How do we rate the value to the um, future generations that aren't getting a choice now about whether they get albatross or fish or um, sh shellfish to be able to eat? So the, the economics argument, I worry, will paint us into a corner. And so it's one of the things to consider, but I wouldn't put all my eggs <coughs> into the economics basket for winning it. Sorry, I had to step out. I'm just very nervous about the governance systems being able to manage things in an adaptive way. I just, the, the, the legal frameworks and the governance frameworks, even with a lot of community outreach, just are not dynamic enough. And I don't see a lot of discussion in the legal community or the governance community about really um, implementing those kind of governance frameworks for decision making. Because I think implicit in all of your studies in some way was a couple really hard decisions that I don't like engineered, I mean engineered in the broadest sense, that somebody's gonna make hard and, 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 and there's gonna be winners and losers. Our governance system is very bad, but it wants to be pretend it's neutral with regard to winners and losers, and I feel like every scenario that people in any of the structures you set out will, will really require some really hard decisions and some give and take and some winners and losers. Um, and I, I just am very nervous about both the legal and the governance management community structures being set up to enable I don't know. Maybe you guys are more familiar with something. I think the fisheries management. I don't see anybody really talking about changing. Everybody knows the problem, but I don't. I don't hear any solutions. Yeah, I think I'm with you. I don't think the law is keeping up. Um, where we are seeing from comparative analysis and things like fisheries is that there are some fisheries that are managed by legislation, right. and that are some that are managed by policy. Yeah. And so, if you make the legislation flexible enough at the top, you provide the um, 
tactical ability for managers to actually make more rapid decision making. Like we, we, will, we will set annual quotas by a science process and the legislation will tell us we will do it. If the legislation said, no, you must, the quota is X, and, that, and until, it, until we change the legislation, it will stay at X. That's a really poor government system. So it's the balance between um, flexibility and direction that, that I and think we need. And certainty. The trust in the managed community in that more flexible system is a huge, huge challenge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just. Over, overlaying on all of this is the, is the rate of change and the fact that climate change is happening so quickly and you know for policy to change the policymakers want concrete data and re, as per Keith just pointed out they, they want to know the economics so, you know what's what's at risk and so what you know just what I've observed what you see is you know, governments coming in and starting let, let's do a study Let, let's see if we can understand you know what's going on here and you know in some cases by the time you get through that you know the system's changed again and you you're, you're into the you know phase two of climate change which are you know, perhaps uh, processes that we haven't anticipated which of course is the you know that's the 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 the, the real uh, uh, perhaps a real danger is the fact that you know as climate change progresses you know one I think we already someone pointed to the fact that it's it, it always seems that it, the actual climate change is outpacing the models, and then two that there are these uh, you know, these unknowns that pop up that we hadn't thought about that may you know suddenly now we're we're scrambling again in the science to keep up. So it's I think it's the rate of change of climate change makes it a difficult uh, to draft policy around as given the current structure of policy making, uh, at least in this country and this. Do we have any other questions? We're, we're close to 3.30, we're, we're supposed to transition to something, so maybe we have time for one more question. Can I make a positive, a positive comment? When, when we propose doing some of these experiments on, on Albatross, <coughs> the, the green groups were not our friends. They didn't want intervention or adaptation to be going on. That said, let's, let's keep this thing natural and the biology will work itself out. And the group that was our friends were the rednecks who said, oh yeah, you want to fix it? Yeah, get in there, be my guest, let's see what you can do. And so there may be hope in the Trump world that we will be able to have more <laughs> flexibility in getting in and fixing things. I, I think that's a great note to end on, is thank our speakers for their excellent talks.